everybody. Welcome to the What Culture Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Taylorford, joined by Josh Brown. Hello, Scott. Hello, and, uh, and John Roy Turner and Ben Roy Turner. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Royce Turner has slipped in. <laughs> well, what about you? Just, you just offed him now. You you think that's me ruined? The <laughs> no, don't. No, I don't. Let you. Just, just keep rolling with it. Basically, you know, what culture gaming podcast thought we would do uh, something based around the games that we've been playing because uh, you know, right now, Cyberpunk is still sort of pulling itself together. The big releases of the year, I think, kind of kick in with Hitman Three. Uh, on the 20th and so until then we've sort of just been picking apart different things one of which being resident evil 6 mr ben roy royth jonathan yes Bronte. what's your raccoon what's... city bitch <laughs> Rack. Why even though you... it's not uh, it was like it was a christmas present okay okay uh for, for people that are listening i've got a raccoon city flag but it was um it's not set in raccoon city obviously resident evil 6 but yes wouldn't have known but i mean resident evil 6 is definitely <laughs> the one that gets tossed to the side the most but i know i know josh brown loves it i know that we i think we didn't we did a whole video on why it's brilliant and we're gonna do another one uh, yeah. right now but both <laughs> you guys have lots of things to say about resident evil 6 and i never got past the first few levels so have at it it's. I would say it's probably a game that should. It plays so much better on the PS4. I feel in my brain because I was much like you, Scott. I I played uh, back in the day because it, it came out when I was in uni as well. And it's really awkward. Mm. You know, it came out during the first few weeks back at uni. So you know who's playing video games then? Lol. Uh, but um, yeah, I played the the Leon campaign and that was it. I was just sort of binned it because Chris the Chris campaign just made me want to vomit like yep. and then eat that. I vomit and then vomit again instead of playing the game and i've beaten it once and really i've looked at i've looked at the trophies and i see i've got resident evil two three four doesn't have one platinum wise five i got it i haven't got six but i've got seven right. so what am i gonna do i'm on the platinum journey again in resident evil six and i'm having a better time than i thought i would even though i didn't enjoy it when i last played it in 2018 is it because it just it plays better like you know it's just smoother or you, you've relaxed, like, relaxed expectations around it because i i always loved five and that was the bigger pivot into like full-on action obviously four is but then five yeah. was kind of more over the top and i always loved five but then six for some reason was just like too much for most people even though it does have like a little following now there are some trash sections of Resident Evil 6, <laughs> but I would never defend it for that. Bit. Like, there's just one when you just you're in a shop, and then people are just there for ages, and then you defend the shop, and then the old man upstairs goes, "All right, you can come up now," and pulls down all these shutters. And you're like, "Why do you just pull down the? Sh- Why am I defending this shop? You can you can save this." And then you got to fight some big giant men, like literally the size of like, seventeen Joshes, like several times. <laughs> and it just and th- there's a bunch of fat jokes in there at some point through that and then the chris one just gets he doesn't the, punch the, a boulder but he might as well destroy a, he destroys a whole european country the chris <laughs> stuff is the stuff that was absolutely held up as what the hell is this franchise doing yeah. like it felt like they were chasing gears of war back when gears was at the height of its um popularity and stuff josh what's your when we when we typed out in the slack thread before we started recording we're going to talk about resident evil 6 and you put love it what why <laughs> why do you love it man because I love talking about it. I don't necessarily love the game, although I will be on Ben Roy's side to an extent and defend it, because I do think it's it's obviously not the best Resident Evil. It's obviously not a great game. <laughs> yeah. But when it came out, man, like it got absolutely slagged off, and everyone was giving it like four out of tens, three out of tens. Like It's not that bad. There are parts of it that I think are really redeemable. Yeah, it's a big mess. Yeah, it's bloated. Yes, it's almost everything wrong with the franchise at that point. <laughs> but there is lots to enjoy in there. Like Ben Roy was saying, like Leon's campaign, it's daft but I genuinely like it. And I think um, so Jake Wesker's better, yeah. campaign is, again, very daft and I quite like it. Chris's does fall down because that's when they are trying to do the geese of war, third person, all out action thing. And that never gelled for me back then. It never gelled for me when I replayed it. But it has like this lingering personality to it that I think about Resident Evil 6 quite often. It was not two days ago, my dudes, <laughs> that my partner turned to me and said, do you want to play Resident Evil 6 co-op? And I, would, I had to think about it. I had to think, yes, maybe That's I'll buy it again on PlayStation 4. They were the one, because no one else... Uh, exactly, yeah. Not even me. <laughs> Jesus. Well, the, can, can I... I 
I um I play a bunch of games with uh, one of my mates every like sort of like Wednesday. We do it like a game in the evening. Mm -hmm. We went through all the Halos last year, the year before. We went through all the Gears of Wars. We go through so much stuff on Game Pass and PlayStation. And I kept going Resident Evil on sale. Resident Evil on sale. <laughs> Resident Evil. I'll PayPal you the four quid for it. Go on. I bought it's I like, bought it for you. It's on your doorstep. Pick it, it up. Resident he, Evil. We went through and he helped me get the Resident Evil Five Platinum. He's a hero, and I just kept going. Well, you know what's next, right? You know, you, you know, like there's nothing. Nothing's gonna be out for a while. And horde mode is getting a bit dry on gears you can do a few shotgun modes so finally he just sent me a screen grab of his receipt for it i was like <laughs> i win but uh, one thing about the leon campaign uh that i must say is leon kind of forgets everything about zombies like, <laughs> there's a one bit where you go into a lift that you find the man and say i need to find my daughter and that is the level of the acting in the game by the way Perfect. you find her she's got a bite mark on her neck this is a man who, <laughs> who survived should i say raccoon city yeah he should. and he's just like yeah it's fine I've, I've seen a few zombies i shot the president spoilers who turned into a zombie right in front of me and doesn't do anything and he goes oh when she turns into a zombie and it's like what the hell was that that's so but that's that's the more problem i have with it than anything else is mm -hmm. that crap well that's what i was going to say do you think the biggest problems with it are in the writing in the dialogue and in, in the scenarios that they set up because the idea of like every major character getting their own campaign like I, I always like the idea of like leon stuff is old school resident evil or is resident evil 4 style and then you've got yeah. chris's which is kind of more like five and then you've got um jake or whatever kind of doing god hand style stuff like melee <laughs> yeah. combat and i like the idea of the ambition of that like you know sort of threading together it's only three campaigns right or is there more? there's a secret fourth aid a one right. campaign yeah yeah mm -hmm. and it's like the idea of that is really cool on paper like you might as well tick all these boxes of what resident evil has become but do you guys like see the appeal in that versus the reality of how bad some of that stuff is written there's certainly an appeal to it like the fact that you get to play as all these characters and they're all different to an extent like is interesting it's what intrigued me at the time and mm. encouraged me to pick it up because capcom's big push at the time was like no matter what kind of resident evil fan you are you're going to have something to enjoy here and they were completely wrong because that's not quite the case at all like they were billing leon's campaign as this survival horror masterpiece mm. and it's not it's just like resident evil 5 it's just like slightly toned down from the Chris one, but there's still a lot to enjoy about that. Like the differing styles of play are interesting. The way the stories intersect are interesting. It's just it's just bogged down with, like Ben Roy said, a lot of weird inconsistencies, a lot of strange developments for the Resident Evil brand. And I think at the time it was particularly badly received because this was supposed to be the future of the franchise mm -hmm. and that would not have been a good direction. But in hindsight, as a um, kind of one strange little experiment, like it works, you know what I mean? It works as this kind of like one-off strange anomaly in the entire franchise that you can appreciate now, you know? I like they how much they, they pushed it. Like they pushed the action yeah. stuff as much as possible. <clears throat> well, they lied to um, people in previews because I remember listening to Jeff Gersman back in the day and they only ever showed him and loads of other people like the the Leon campaign. They didn't, mm. they weren't out there really. Like, and then and, and then in the market and they had all the Chris stuff and then people got to play as Chris and like, what the hell is this sort of thing? <laughs> and man, it's the, so long. It's yeah, the, so the Chris long. stuff too. Like it's it was always held up as like oh, it's zombies with guns. Is that the case? The zombies learn how to fire back, or who, what is it that's shooting back at you in those bits? Yes, essentially. <laughs> they're called Juavos. Basically, they're just an evolution of the Maginis from Number Five, and then mm. I. I can't remember the name of the um, the ones in four, but no one really cares there apart from me. Uh, oh, Ganados? Ganados, yes, that was yeah. it. And they're just an evolution of that again, but they don't flinch when you shoot them. Mm. And then they transform into things that can take you down even in two hits on like normal difficulty. So it's just like, ugh. And there are a lot of points in that Chris campaign where you can almost run out of ammo. It's like mm. yeah. they almost want you to punch. Like that game wants you to punch everything when it goes to a knee. Right, right. Well, that was, that, that was the thing that took off in four when you realized you could do a suplex, like you wound oh, something. In the, yeah. And that was really cool. And I love all that stuff. I get the argument that it's not like traditional Resident Evil, but I like what that became in four. Um, I was going to say as, as well, like in six, uh, I remember from the demo of six, when you play as Leon, I'm sure um, you can. there's a bunch of different ways that you can fire. Like you can go into the aiming mode when you're on the ground or if you get knocked back and then you can still shoot back. Feature. That stuff was really cool. And I remember when Metal Gear Solid 4 added that as well. Like, I don't know, like just little parts like that sort of enhance like the general feel of it, but it also takes away from being on the back foot, like having horror as a feel. For me, it works um, almost if you 
don't imagine it as part of Resident Evil canon because like mm. the stuff they add to the combat system, like that ability to, you know, throw yourself to the ground, shoot in all these different directions. Like there's a real fluidity to the combat system that works. And I think partly the game is best played in mercenaries mode where you have like a context free experience and there's no story. And you're just literally fighting zombies mm -hmm. because you get to indulge in all of those great mechanics. You get to go wild with the melee system. You get to go wild pulling off these headshots, turning them into suplexes, turning them into drop kicks. And it all, it all to quote Todd Howard, it all just works. Like it clicks in those moments and it's this big dumb action spectacle. It just, when you try to graft that onto a Resident Evil plot and call it even vaguely survival horror it does just kind of fall <laughs> apart and becomes this incongruous mess in there, a way there are just also i will say playing it now the virus is called the c virus and you go to china to solve it and yeah. i'm just like why am i playing this right now and it's just like <laughs> i was just like that game I, I, it predicted it's, the future. It's such, I, I won't say i won't be one of those like but it was just such a weird thing to play and like say it's got the chainsaw person in this again but mm -hmm. the chainsaw person its arm is a chain it's a bio chainsaw it's the bones are going around like a oh. chainsaw it's that sort of level of just like what the hell man and then like <laughs> there's i just it's just so much about it that i'm just trying to like get out of my chest like the ada one campaign the secret one that a lot of people didn't know about until mm -hmm. it came out like you play, everything's co-op right so you play a is only one for the flight one of the first times substantially mm -hmm. and then they don't bother putting anyone in there you just play as man but oh. this man <laughs> might could look so much like hunk they should have just made it hunk for re2 and just right. did more fan service and then i have to be even more angry because what the hell i almost i'm trying not to sweat are claire and you Jill said bitch doing? before but we'll carry on ah bitch isn't a swear word get out <laughs> of it uh, but yeah Jill and claire could have easily been inserted into the chris campaign and made his descent downwards more believable right. but no they're just relegated to the side jill's just gone in Rev revelations wherever and same with claire mm -hmm. and like as we talk about to the combat the way you can jump around and land on the floor and pull out two pistols it's weird because it's like they never looked at a resident evil game before but the two animated films that came before this which you love that, they're the third one that the first one is a little better <laughs> but it's basically because leon and chris are like ninja rolling ranch over they're like basically gun foo in all these zombies it's basically <laughs> just that at one point like leon rides a motorbike up a giant zombie thing bam 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 like full anime and kicks the bike at them and stuff and then they took that and made it a game i was like oh it if is you do, if, oh, go on, if no, you sorry, just go tap um like r2 scott like you do this thing called like a quick shot where yes. you'll just pull off these kind of like western style trick shots and it's it's more or less really cool, right? gun food it is cool it is cool <laughs> but it doesn't match anything that came before or since is the problem i think that i think's really interesting with resident evil you look back on that that trajectory after re4 that like you had gears was taken off third person cover shooters were taken off and it's almost like someone at capcom was like well we should completely do that because we started it with re4 and we should just do more over the top action stuff and there was like that strand of resident evil like i don't know the, the, as the as an ip like ben where you said the movies like embrace that really over the top yeah. stuff so then they were like well we can kind of it's kind of anime anyway like crazy plot twists and all these over the top like, character returns from the dead and whatever like you've got all these really dumb over the top saturday morning cartoon anime things anyway but they kind of pull all the way back from that in seven it's, it's like it's kind of uh, sorry to jump in it's kind hmm. of their end game in the fact that everyone's almost there and it's like a world ending event and now because at, at this point in the game it's like raccoon city is still secret it's not like in the alice films where everyone knew about raccoon city and they got out and it killed the world now raccoon city is still secret and like leon is about to expose it and then this other guy who's been in the shadows for years it's like you can't do that and then he then they all destroy china and everywhere else and then like parts this fake I don't know why they include China as a country here, but then mm. a fake European country called Adonia. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm right to saying that that's not a real country. Like, it's just I like thought, well, I'm, I'm literally going to Google it right now. But carry on, because if it is, I'm sorry to. It's like that place. Well, in, you uh, slagging off the Adonians again? It, it's, like in, it's like in. Um, what's that? It film real, with? No, it's not. It, it's not a real place. It's a it's fictional place invented for Resident Evil. Uh, it's a small Eastern European country. It's but like it's that, um, the fake country they made in one of the Marvel films as well, the second Avengers. Like, just it's weird how they pick random, like, they just do that, but then they will represent other countries. It's, but there's, there's a point, sorry, I just remembered <laughs> where you get bitten by a shark, and then this giant shark, which is whole purpose, by the way, if you read the wiki, which I have done, is yes. just to eat 
old biomatter. It's basically just a rubbish keeper, like in bloody Star Wars Episode 4. It's not that little squid thing. But it bites it, it's crabbing you by your leg after you've done swimming under, and you're going down this water slide, and Leon's on it trying to shoot it, and Helena's in the mouth going, No, help me. And it's uh, what the hell is going some of the points <laughs> just go right off, and I'm so wow. I will say well, I was just to, as a little addendum to all any Adonians listening, um Adonia is a tran- is a um a translation of yeah. Adonis or a, 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 a Adonida. Um, so Adonia is a real place, or was an ancient region of Thrace. So just, you know, <laughs> Macedonia. It's, Capcom uh, repurposed it then. For this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Trying to imply that sort of more action-based things should have happened there. But overall, would either of you, are you recommending res- people play Resident Evil 6 in 2021? Because I might go pick it up. With a friend, because it's very cheap. And, yes. and also, if you play all the campaigns, you've got like 20 plus hours of gameplay there. I mean, at some points it can be very sort of like disorientating and like, what's going on anymore but it it's a it's a fun romp with friends to be like how bad this can get sometimes <laughs> all right yeah well, honestly with, the game with friends it's a good laugh because when it's good you're laughing it's like oh this is a really good um third person shooter when right. it's bad you can both be like what is going on what's happening why is leon doing a wheelie on a on a motorbike and ha- he's got four hands somehow four hands and four guns and he's just Has shooting he? all these no but he might as well <laughs> um and it's just mad it's madness also, and it's a game that i don't know how, i don't know how it got made don't know how it got made troy baker's in and i keep forgetting that he's is in it? it he plays jake wesker and he calls right. sherry babe a lot i'm like <laughs> Ugh. it's just like what the f- <laughs> it's like a totally different troy baker to what we have now well, he, it's I so mean, weird it predate right what I feel yeah, it predates, came out him, but it predates. Uh, it's before The Last of Us because yes. The Last of Us came out yeah. after. Because 2013 was the year that made him like Bioshock Infinite yeah. and Last of Us. Um, whereas beforehand he was stuck doing this and being like snow <laughs> in Final Fantasy 13. Um, we should also move on to other stuff that we've been playing. Resident Evil 6, though, a contentious topic which continues to potentially be positive that we might check back in on. I might pick it up. We could do a thing on it. You never know. I just shouted well. for ages. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. No, you've got many things to say. As the resident Resident Evil expert, you should have many things to say. Anyway, um, we should go on to uh, Visage or Visage or Visage. Not PT, the thing that uh, Josh has been playing, which is kind of sweeping the internet a little bit. It came out at the end of last year uh, on yeah. PC, and now it's on consoles and stuff. And uh, it's sort of routinely been held up as like the scariest game ever. Like it's you're saying it's one of it's literally one of the it's- scariest things you've ever played. Yes, absolutely. Like it's perhaps the scariest game of the gen. It was on our um, best horror games of 2020 list, and it topped that. Mm-hmm. And for good reason, man. Like I only knew about this because your friend and mine, Ash Millman, was playing it, and she was talking about it, and it looked like my cup of bovril. So I was like, All right, I'll give this a go. And um, because, like you said, it's very much indebted to PT. Like there were so mm-hmm. many PT clones coming out when that thing got cancelled. But this, for me, from the ones at least I've seen and the ones I've played, like, is the best one because while it is very much inspired to the point where the very first thing you do is mimic what you did in PT, waking up in this kind of thing, going Staring through the door, the going down the hallway, yeah, it's one for one, more or less. Like, it isn't just a kind of, you know, homage. It isn't just ripping that off. It has its own ideas. It expands on things that game brought to attention and it just doubled down on them in the creepiest ways possible and i i was um I, I was talking to someone on twitter last night and i was saying like the best thing it does is kind of like restraint it's not like mm. your layers of fear or your even your outlast even like two franchises i love that i feel like i feel like when you play some horror games you're there saying oh that's scary oh that's quite horrific but right. you're not actually feeling it you know what i mean with visage i feel it i feel every single second of it because it's so subtle in places but it isn't afraid to go completely wacky and hit you with like this surreal um house that's constantly changing or hit you with a strange dream sequence or go completely abstract and inject a bit of comedy when you least expect it and surprise you like the it has so many surprises up its sleeve and i love it man like i could talk about it all day like i wish oh i wish i played it last year some of the stuff that I saw, like, was the um, was a guy walking down like one of the corridors, and like a, a ghost or like a, a being sort of like flashed in front of him, like sort of did like a thing, like a I don't know, like a, appearing out of the ether for like a second. So you sort of got that immediate like right in the face style jump yeah. scare. Um, and I saw another one where um, it was like like one of the doors was just slowly opening on like an upstairs level and stuff. And it's like, is it like an atmospheric stuff like that that occasionally is like massive spike to sort of give you like a volume spike jump scare? Like, what's this kind of general setup? Is that just there has to be more plot to it i guess 
there is more plot. There's a, certainly a plot to unveil, but essentially you're exploring this one house and there's a bunch of locked doors. There's a bunch of places that you can't go and you're solving puzzles to get key items to open those doors to get mm. to different parts of the house. But then it changes by supernatural means. But essentially there's this one ghost and there are a few other things that I won't spoil. There's one ghost kind of like haunting you and you've got a sanity meter and you've got this kind of... Well, you've got... I can't remember the other one is. You've got a sanity meter and you've got something else. So if you stand in the darkness for too long... Like, and if you, if you look at creepy things for too long, like you do in Amnesia, the mm. more chances are that this ghost is going to appear, the more chances are that she's going to get you. So you right. need to you need to find lighters on the floor, for instance, and, you know, use that until it runs out to go through dark places or light candles and put them on candlestick holders to illuminate parts where the bulb goes out or pop some pills if your sanity's gone so you don't get caught by it. But the way it's paced and the way it ramps up the tension is great because you get those subtle moments like someone, um, you know, presses the doorbell and you have to go and investigate and someone stood outside or you just see like um uh the silhouette of someone down the hall like you do in pt and you have to go somewhere right. else but the audio is so great as well playing it with headphones you can again it has that pt thing of you feel like someone's always oh. behind you you can hear someone breathing you can hear someone kind of talking you can hear the children's cry coming from the other room and the fact that you don't know where this person is and the fact that it remains surprising throughout is the biggest strength because for as scary as horror games can get like outlast i absolutely love mm -hmm. sometimes you see the monster so much and you might get to a fail state so many times that it kind of becomes more of a frustration or a nuisance i don't think you get that with visage like every single time i have been killed or whatever it, it hasn't reduced the scare factor of the thing that's killing me or it hasn't been any less surprising. Like, it's it's just great how they use the space as well. Like, I'll stop rambling in a second, but the way they use the house, it makes you scared of certain parts of it. Like, I am terrified to go upstairs in this game because right. that just apparently is where I am the worst at the game and where I <laughs> see you the most and where I'm the most vulnerable. And every single time I get like a... A prompt to go to a certain room up there i just have to i have to stop for five minutes and just get my bearings and think like <laughs> do i have enough lighters do i have enough candles can i make it up there without I a super quick thing frightened. but is there is there combat in it or you are just at the mercy of ghost inspectors and everything yeah, more or less she's at the mercy. Like, there's not really... There, there are some kind of, like, escape um, elements where you have to, like, sort of turn around or whatever, but it's not like... You're not, like, sort of hiding from scripted people or whatever. Mm. It, or you're not fighting, certainly. Like, it's very... The game itself is very rough and tumble. It has a few rough edges in terms of animations and presentation, and you can tell that it was, like, built by a small team, but mm. the, the, the amount that they achieve is, like... Is, is, oh, it's incredible, man. Like, I, want, I want you to play it, but I realize it's quite steep asking you to pay it's 30 pounds at the moment. Yeah, pay, 29 yeah. bones for this game that's quite unproven, but ah, love it. Love it, boys. <laughs> ben, have you heard of this thing? Are you prepared to I, going into it? I heard of it when um, I, I think I recommended Josh's film the other day, and then he's like, but then you need to play this game. And I was like, oh, what's this game? And it was kind of like one of those where this does sound like everything I want. And, yeah. <laughs> but why why did not, why have i not heard about it until Same. this moment in time and mm -hmm. it, it's weird like everything josh has said that he sold me on and i feel like i'm gonna play it co-op with um with someone else and just like so we can we you know can enjoy it together sort of like mm -hmm. the way i i've done like i think i did i've mentioned before like resident evil 7 i did that like that and just made enhanced experience i've done amnesia like that so uh, I, I I really want to get into this, but yeah, the third, like, even if it's thirty bones, like right now I've got Resident Evil Six to play, and then hit, <laughs> I know I want to get that planned and God yes. of War planned before uh, Hitman Three comes out, like mm -hmm. in a week or so. So it's definitely now on the list of things I'm going to play, and I've got my eye on it. Thanks to Josh and this episode sponsored by Ash Millman, who <laughs> <laughs> thanks, yeah, exactly. Thanks very much to WhatCulture.com. I like the idea of picking this thing up. Maybe we might we might do like a um, updated horror podcast because we haven't done a horror-specific gaming pod in a little while and we can sort of recommend other things like this. Because obviously Phasmophobia did the rounds at the end of last year, obviously way more fun, party-based thing, but also had some great scares in it. Um, I want to end on Hitman 2 because because Hitman 3 is out soon, I've just been going back to Hitman 2. Um, and I dropped off that back in uh, 2018 or whatever the year was that it came out because I just, I went back and I played a bunch of Hitman 1 because I was excited for 2 and then I went straight into 2 and I just kind of burned out on it. I played way too much of it. Which you would hilariously say is what I'm redoing now because three is about to come out. <laughs> but um, having played two, I want to uh, broach this potential thing. Benroy, did you watch the cutscenes in Hitman Two? 
before yes. I say why. Because I love the story in two, and it's just got to a certain spot where like they're starting to explain what's going on with Lucas Gray and Lucas Gray's connection to 47. And as like a lifelong Hitman fan, that's a big deal. Like that's that's just really, really cool. Talking to Mr. GB Josh Brown this morning, though, he he's busting out that he skipped all the cutscenes, that he's not he's not bothered about it. And that wounds oh. me. It, exactly. That's the reaction that I <laughs> well, had. I wanted to see if you were, because I was going to ask, did you play the campaign or did you play mission by mission? Because uh, Josh went mission by mission. As a man who has done a video on this very channel called uh, Agent 47 of the Dark Parts of Hitman Explained, or in some argumentation, I love the Hitman lore and I love Hitman, the franchise. I love the Hitman, Agent 47. You love hitting men. It's yeah. And, every type. and that was one of my big cry. Even though I would say right now, Hitman 2 is the best Hitman game ever made because mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. just involves the last one. It's just, I mean, come on, we all know it plays better than Blood Money. Let's just all get yeah, over it. Yeah. 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 There opinion. are some people out there that just defend it forever. For some reason but like <laughs> it, like i was upset those cutscenes weren't full-on cutscenes, and i think a lot of people were because if you play the dlc they revert back to cutscenes. Right. so the dlc stuff actually has rather than like a motion what do you call it a motion graphics it's kind of like a, it's like a digital comic they sort of just do yeah. like stills that are slightly animated like peace like, walker kind of thing. josh do you know anything about agent 47 at all well, yeah, well, this is the thing. This is I, there wasn't me attacking of, you, so I just, well, I just wondered. I... Yeah, like, this is kind of why, I guess, it's so contentious that I don't really gel with the story. It's only because you're missing I... out. It's only just because it's so good. <laughs> and when you told me you hadn't seen it, I was I thought when I said the thing that I just got, I thought you were going to go, man, I've been waiting two years for you to see that. And then you went, skip them, mate, not bothered. Like, oh, <laughs> you've wow. missed well, it. Uh, let, let me clarify and defend myself. You know, the prosecution has rested. I'm going to get up in the defense. <laughs> um, like when it comes to like Age of 47 and the law of Hitman, like I'm brushed up on it because I used to be like a huge Hitman fan. I did come in quite late with Blood Money, but um, loved Blood Money, even loved Absolution and um, mm. didn't get around to Hitman 1 until very late and then jumped into Hitman 2 and went back to play them both. But when like the setup of Hitman 2, to me, even though I watched like the prologue, watched the initial cutscenes and stuff, just the setup of the game feels so artificial that I can't get into the story that even though I watched the thing that sets everything up, because I was playing through the levels over and over again rather than moving on linearly, like I just forgot things. I forgot the context and I was playing it more as like a sandbox like a, like a play box of toys where Hitman 47, I got him out in his little Lego and there were a few contracts <laughs> over here. Yeah. And I was just messing about in the sandbox or, or replaying it, trying to get every single assassination and then eventually moving on like a week later and I had forgotten everything. So I was like, what? I have no investment in this story. It's just, it's strange because I never skip, I never skip cutscenes, but here mm. I was like skipping over those in-betweens just to get to the next mission or even swapping around the missions so I would miss it. And then I would go back to it and obviously know what happens and stuff, but it faded from my memory as quickly as I watched them. You know what I mean? I think I, I said to you before, when we were talking about this before recording, but like of all the games that you could do this with, I think Hitman is the most forgiving in that respect. Like you can completely get 90% of the most out of Hitman 2 by just going mission to mission, enjoying yeah. the mechanics and taking people out and exploring the different ways you can kill dudes. It's just that I just love what they did. And it's like, it's not that it's anything incredibly unique, but I think it's well done. And I, I care, I think adding an extra dimension of like a uh, plot drive to each one of those contracts. Like I care about those people I'm taking out because I want to get like some revenge or I want to, you know, take this particular person out or I want to find this information that's hidden in a level to like, you know, get to the next level and stuff. And it's not that the, it's not that the narrative branches, but I just love that they added that. Like I, I didn't realize that I wanted it until I, until they did it. And I was like, oh man, like having a narrative backbone to all these kills is actually really, really cool. And I hope they carry yeah. that through in three. What they've done... Of... Sorry, no better. Pop. I was now it's all gone out of my mind. <laughs> Sabotage. Uh, yeah, just you you're up next. <laughs> <laughs> what I was gonna say was I've forgotten my point as well now. What I was gonna say was I think it's kind of goes down to like the way I played it. Like I said, like I could never have that emotional drive or investment to want to off these dudes because I almost had like no canon version of their demise. Like by the time I'd killed them for the twelfth time, mm. the emotional edge had kind of dulled and I was doing it for the sake of it, not doing it because I had this drive of oh, those are bad dudes. I need to take them out in a specific way like uh, I didn't have that kind of like through line between things and I think that might be because I didn't play the campaign version because when I bought it it was years after the fact where they'd added a bunch of content and the thing that they'd throw me into was just the level select screen so I was just right. like oh I guess I just 
jump in here after the prologue and just try my luck. It is weird and, that the campaign is like you've got a button across to get to it and it does sort of yeah, land yeah. you on the home page. Yeah, it is It is a little bit hidden. So I remembered what I was going to say now. Go what they've it. done with those cutscenes and the gameplay, well, the cutscenes majorly, I think this is what has sold uh, like MGM to give them the Bond license. Like this is sort mm. of like spy thriller that they can sort of tell through drips and drabs and then have like a nice little cutscene more so at the end. And like, I think like... Like we said, it people have said it one off rage, like, yeah, they could do a Bond game IO, and then they've actually got it because I think they've got it because of these two new Hitman games have sold people on this sort of fact. And even from it's just nice to see that, even though it's like a reboot, it's not because it still continues from those old games. So, so going back through, like, you you won't want to play some of those old games again because they're they, they they they've aged poorly, but like, I don't go through and like keeping that sort of lineage. I love, I love a game or a franchise that keeps stuff going in some way yeah. or makes it work because like even absolution was and also i was thinking i think absolution came out the same year as resident evil 6 so maybe josh <laughs> just had a moment at that point it's like i'm liking all these games. I was oh. like uh, the games the year when some of my franchises almost died and never came back just bringing them thing. back to life just jolt them enough you can keep them going <laughs> i think absolution always looked gorgeous but i didn't like a lot of the levels in it yeah. and like the sort of I, I like what they attempted to do with that but i think they do it better by just sort of putting it in the background like having the story based stuff in the background and arguably it's proven that it is optional because josh still loves hitman 2 but didn't follow the story stuff and it's you know it's on you whether or not you want to do that or not they just they just saved it they saved a character which is the most Mil- like boiler player there. it's just like mad bald man one right like if you go into <laughs> yeah. a character creator and they and they've had the same voice actor for 20 years and mm-hmm. the hitman franchise is 20 years old for god's oh my god how old are we and I, I love how they just sort of kept that going and they've injected more comedy into it for other thing and like you've always kind of been killing bad people you've never really been killing innocent people for this mm-hmm. no unless you just go onto the streets and you're a madman but like there's always been they they managed to successfully like update it and like and keep everyone on board almost and bring new people in which I'm just so fascinated with and I'm so happy that we have these soon to be three new games that are just pretty much on point and the best the, the franchises have been. Mm-hmm. Josh, what's your closing thoughts? Well, I do want to clarify that just because I didn't engage with the story, I'm not saying what they did with it is bad or anything like that. Far from it. I'm just sort of, I think it's interesting that you guys just fell so in love with it. But for me, I just like, it was not on my radar at all, well, that story perspective. But I can be t- lot- I can completely like side though, like with your thing, because I started in 2018 when it came out, I did the first three missions and then I just, I just dropped off it. Something else came out. I wasn't hooked. It's not until you do the Mumbai mission. And just after that, that you get the big lore drop. Mm. And that's when it's like, oh, you just did something that's really cool. And that's when it changes. Ah, see, that's, uh, I don't know, man. maybe I need to go back and sort of properly look at those cutscenes. But while I didn't really engage with the law, I do agree with what Ben Roy said about Agent 47 as a character. Like, I love the stuff that they do with him in the missions. Like, they make him this, like, banter hound who suddenly can, like, crack wise about the people he's murdering and when he's donning a disguise and he's having a lot of fun with it. Like, that was a version of that character I'd never seen before. And I appreciated those little touches so much, like those mm-hmm. little elements kept me invested in the world in a way that those kind of weird cutscenes, exposition dumps just sort of didn't. So it's, it's, it's just, I think it's just fascinating that we all think this is a great game, but we all came at it from kind of slightly different perspectives and we all engaged with a part of the story uh, that is slightly different different I'll I think, in a different way. and it keeps stealth alive like this the yeah, one does, thing man. that that isn't a giant four thousand hour open world that has stealth in it like it's like legit a stealth game mm-hmm. if you want it to be it's interesting because um we are going to like sort of close this down and stuff but it's interesting because it's like the way that doom eternal the way the doom slayer is written like all that stuff is in the background yeah. it's all in the in the lore details it's all in text entries you get minuscule cutscenes. um you know and the whole ethos of, of 2016 doom was just doom slayer punching stuff out of his way when someone tried to talk to him or like some sort of you know screen with some information on you know you can sort of have all this writing that's sort of it's like writing in like negative space it's just there if you <laughs> want to find it but it's not so- up front Again, Hitman was tw- the first Hitman was 2016, and that's when they changed. Hitman kind of died in 2012 with Resident Evil 6 and was reborn with Doom 2016. <laughs> and it's, it's just so weird the trajectory of it. But yeah, I, I agree with pretty much everything you two are saying. And in both cases, they're now Doom and Hitman are both going stronger than ever because they've managed to nail down their protagonists as this they, blend of like memory yeah. and like, you know, uh, something more lore based as well. 100%. 
Beautiful. Well, yes, you can uh, find us on social media. Let us know what you think of the likes of Hitman, Visage, 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 and Resident Evil 6. Um, because for now, this has been the What Culture Gaming Podcast. I've been your host, Scott Tailford, joined by Ben Roy Turner. Raccoon City, bitch. <laughs> they can't hear you in silence from Ben Roy Turner. <laughs> and Mr. Josh Brown. Goodbye. See you later, John Roy. I'll uh, talk to you <laughs> <What>? soon. <laughs> John Roy. Catch you next time. Thank you very much, and bye. Bye. See you. Yeah.